Well, uh, my name's uh, Shanto Iyengar. Um, thanks to the organizers uh, for asking me, and um, thanks for you all for showing up. I want to warn you in advance that uh, this is not going to be the most uplifting of presentations. Uh, but essentially, uh, the main takeaway from Doug's uh, presentation was that in this era, evidence and expertise uh, is often ignored and reinterpreted if it doesn't uh, fit in with people's uh, existing uh, beliefs. And so certainly the, the, the Academy report on the benefits of immigration uh, was the headlines where you know, the cost to the American taxpayer, uh, so on and so forth. What I'm gonna try and, uh, and do in the next uh, eight or nine minutes is, uh, is uh, convince you that this, this problem of uh, uh, this bias, or the inability to, to take expertise and evidence at face value is very much rooted in American sense of uh, political identity. Uh, the idea that they feel that they are either Democrat or Republican and that this sense of group affili affiliation has developed, uh, has, has resulted in a surprisingly intense form of in-group, out-group uh, polarization. Um, okay, so um, if I can figure out how the... Uh, Beat top green one. I got it. So uh, there's a lot of uh, data, American National Election Studies and Pew data, which document increasing hostility toward the out party. Uh, so if you're a Republican, uh, you basically don't like the Democrats. And there's also a lot of data on social distance, uh, things like uh, declining rates of intermarriage across the party divide. Now you might say that this is simply uh, an artifact of surveys, because you, know, you, you get people uh, in an online survey and you ask them, you know, what do you think about Democrats? Uh, they've, they've just got, gotten done answering a bunch of questions about racial minorities, religious groups, uh, uh, gender groups, and everyone realizes that there are certain norms that apply and you have to be sort of careful about what you say, but then you ask about a Democrat or a Republican and then people can say, wow, I can actually now tell you what I believe. And so it could be that these survey data I'm about to show you, there may be some artifact there that the people are not constrained, they don't feel they have to be politically correct when they're answering questions about Democrats or Republicans. After all, people, people select their political affiliation. It's not something that's ascriptive or fixed at birth. Uh, so uh, anyway, I'm gonna show you some data that it's not, I don't believe it's an artifact. We've also got uh, subconscious uh, measures of bias. If you've taken the uh, implicit association test, uh, if you're uh, someone with a background in psych, you're probably familiar with the race implicit association test. We've mimicked uh, that test using images of parties instead of uh, <coughs> black and white faces, and I'll show you the data. Uh, it's quite impressive. Uh, it shows that implicit uh, bias against the opposition party dominates uh, bias against uh, racial minorities. And finally, we've also got some behavioral data suggesting that people are less trusting of people on the other side of the party divide. So I don't think one, one can discount these results and simply say, oh, it's just some kind of a artifact of survey research. Okay, so uh, we know from social identity theory that, that humans tend to uh, gravitate to groups and once they form a group, they develop these hostile feelings about the outgroup. Uh, this seems to be just inevitable. Uh, in the political domain today, uh, political scientists have coined the term sorting, meaning that uh, the, the political divide between Democrats and Republicans is now sort of amplified because you've got a series of reinforcing cleavages. It's not just Democrats and Republicans, but there's also race, gender, age, religion, where you live. All of those divides are thrown in. And so uh, partisan opponents today represent uh, what some have called uh, the repugnant cultural other. Uh, so in a sense, it's not surprising that partisanship has become a litmus test for interpersonal relations. There's a lot of data on uh, uh, family groups, uh, friendship groups, uh, 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 Facebook data on uh, the composition of 80% uh, 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 of your friends uh, on social media have the same political affiliation that you have. So groups are increasingly politically homogeneous. So what, what does this do? Well, Paul, as Doug pointed out, there's a lot of news organizations out there that are now catering to, uh, to partisan preferences. Uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 mistrust, uh, 
A recent poll, 46% think the media make up stories about President Trump. Uh, we've got increasing uh, circulation of these outlets that have very strong uh, uh, partisan uh, uh, reputations. And this, of course, creates a potential echo chamber where people simply receive information that reinforces uh, their preferences. Uh, this is a study we did in the course of 2016. Uh, a lot of people are now self-selecting into these sources. Okay, uh, so again, when partisans encounter information at odds with their identity, with their preferences, they counter-argue, they often move further away from the evidence-based position. Uh, the credibility of universities, think tanks, and government agencies are now uh, suspect. Uh, and in a sense, as if you've been following the news uh, uh, in Alabama, you can see that you know, partisans seem content uh, to pretty much follow their leaders, come what may. Okay, I'm now I'm just going to show you some data. It's going to go very fast. I've only got about five minutes. So these are uh, the American National Election Studies, which goes all the way back to the 1960s, has been asking people this particular question, where you're asked, you know, how do you feel about a variety of groups, including the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. The top two lines are Democrats and Republicans' evaluations of their own party. This is all on a zero to 100 point scale. 100 means you're very warm, very positive. Zero, you're very cold, very negative. And as you can see, uh, everyone's quite enthusiastic about their own party, but beginning in the late 1980s, a significant drop in the rating of the opposition party. So the gap, the affective gap between the ins and the outs, expanding over time. In the last couple of cycles, post-2000, quite an alarming trend is the increasing percentage of Americans who are willing to give the opposition party a score of zero. In other words, the maximum, minimum, the lowest point on the feeling thermometer and in terms of, you know, we ask about lots of different groups, Muslims, atheists, there is no group that comes as close to the out party in terms of dislike, okay? It is the, that's the, it's the gold medal, the gold medalist. Uh, the bottom panel shows the percentage of Americans who express some kind of reservation about a son or daughter marrying into the party that's not the party of the parent. In 1960, the top panel is a baseline, the United Kingdom, another two-party system. And you notice that in 1960, uh, actually Ken is quite familiar with the study, a study done by Armand and Verber. It's a classic study in comparative politics. You can see it's basically, most of the Americans asked this question, thought it was a joke. Uh, you know, why would I be bothered if my son or daughter married a Democrat or Republican? I'm more interested in, you know, is this guy rich or not? <laughs> And later on, uh, that, you, you notice that in the last two iterations of this question, it's quite, quite dramatic. Substantial uh, uh, portions of the American public seem to believe that intermarriage is a problem. Okay, so that's social distance. Uh, so this is the, uh, the, the IAT I was telling you about. So the top panel shows you the, the level of implicit prejudice against the out party. And you can see that the gap between Democrats and Republicans is considerably larger than the gap between whites and blacks in the case of the implicit, the race implicit associations. So, so prejudice, subconscious prejudice against the opposition party exceeds subconscious uh, prejudice based on race. Okay, so uh, Doug talked about online echo chambers. You can look at, this is from that web browsing study. You can see that the Drudge Report, 86% of the audience is Republican. Uh, the Washington Post, 13% uh, of the audience is Republican. So there's a lot of segregation now in people's uh, exposure to news. Uh, the hostile media effects, more or less the same question. People distrust uh, mainstream media sources, particularly people on the right. Well, uh, there's also a lot of data on uh, so-called alternative facts. Uh, did the Obama administration wiretap Trump? You can see there's a huge gap between Democrats, Republicans, and independents. And the same thing uh, in terms of did Russia uh, try to sway the election. Okay, now I promised uh, Nathan Lee, who's uh, writing his dissertation at Stanford, he's, he's, he's done the school study on what happens when you actually give policymakers expert information. 
in this case uh, concerning uh, the benefits of uh, needle exchange programs. And notice the panel on the right. His, this is a sample of state and local officials. Uh, when they're given uh, this information, the Republicans actually uh, move away from the advocate, advocated position. Uh, so if anything, uh, expertise here is having a sort of a boomerang effect. Okay, so I thought, I, uh, uh, something that, can we do something to break this cycle of increasing hostility and animus across the divide? Uh, one possible treatment for dampening pol polarization is uh, kinder, gentler rhetoric uh, from high places. I, 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 I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, if I was you, I would not be losing a lot of sleep over that possibility. <laughs> Increased interpersonal contact across the party divide, because we've got some really uh, interesting data. About 15% of marriages in this country today are between people of opposing registrations. And there's some really uh, cool uh, data showing that these people, when you, when you look at the evaluations of Trump and Clinton in 2016, it's quite remarkable. Uh, they have very moderate evaluations. On that feeling thermometer, it's plus or minus 10 from the midpoint. Whereas people in same party marriages, uh, the average rating of, uh, of Clinton voters of Trump was something like eight and vice versa. So interpersonal contact might be a good thing, but the question is uh, uh, how do you bring it about? Uh, Increased uh, uh, mobilization of nonpartisans, uh, that's also something that's probably not, not, not entirely uh, plausible. And finally, in the case of immigration, I just wanted to point out uh, to Doug that there is this uh, quite a bit of literature on the so-called uh, person positivity bias. So if you frame the issue of immigration in, in personalized terms and talk about individual immigrants as opposed to the policy, policy in general, uh, people tend to be uh, uh, somewhat more uh, supportive. And on that note, I will end. Thank you. <laughs>